tactical environment. It's very important that you, uh, that the people in special warfare, uh, understand and know how to use hand-to-hand -hand combat. Many individuals in the Naval Special Warfare community study hand-to-hand -hand because it's, it's very applicable to what they're doing. Body control, breath control, uh, mindset, discipline, and training. All those elements are part of uh, the study of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I believe it's important for a Naval Special Warfare personnel to study hand-to-hand -hand combat is because in today's environment, SEALs go into areas where rules of engagement are very specific and they're, and they're very uh, controlled. And uh, specifically, you may go into a structure where there's, there's uh, targets, we call them shoot targets, and there are no shoot targets. And, or you may be in, involved in a hostage rescue situation, and that's going to call for you to get close to people and get your hands on them. Now they may be they may be uh, aggressors, or they may be people that are just uh, very excited about the situation, and they're caught up in the moment. And I know that I need to know how to handle them, uh, the physicality of the situation. I need to know what's happening. I need to be uh, competent in that area. I'm carrying a firearm. It's a, it's a high stress situation, and you want to make a, a good decision. So hand to hand directly relates uh, whether the threat's actively pursuing you or uh, you, you find yourself uh, in the middle of the situation. For my uh, environment, is I need techniques that work now and work fast. The same thing is the techniques I have to use. I have to be able to take a threat out now. I don't have time to sit here and get in a wrestling match with him. I don't need to be in a wrestling match. If I have my partner's doing his job, the only thing I need to do, the techniques I need to do, if somebody comes at me with a knife or a weapon and my gun is down or I if I can just neutralize that threat, if I can just take that knife and keep it from stabbing me for a few seconds, my partner's come along and he's going to take care of that threat for me. He'll be right there, and he has many, many times. You have to remember that uh, Naval Special Warfare, when we're act out actually operating, we're going to have a lot of gear. Uh, you're not going to see the fancy uh, flying sidekicks and, and, and spectacular throws and, and, and low-line sweeps and things like that. Uh, we go for the practical. Uh, we, we, we realize that there's always teams involved, there's other individuals involved, there's weapons involved, so our hand-to-hand -hand, uh, integrates all these elements. Okay, gentlemen, my name is James Williams. I'm a consultant instructor with uh, Combative Concepts and Unarmed Combat, Edged Weapons, Weapons Retention, Takeaway. We want to do to start today is understand the system that we're dealing with. The system that we're dealing with is a human being. Okay? Human beings have certain attributes okay, and certain peculiarities. We're going to learn how to utilize both those things in our combative situation. One of the first things we have is how human beings interact with gravity, okay? the immutable law of gravity. As a biped, two-legged, human beings are basically unstable. Okay. If he moves forward, he has to replace a leg that's non-existent in order to stay balanced. Backwards, the same way. Triangulation is, uh, is a point in space where the, the human being needs support, and we actually allow him to go into that point. We allow him to fall. We let gravity work for us. We don't have to make someone fall to the ground by hurling them to the ground. Gravity will take care of that for us. 
through the understanding of triangulation points, we can allow the individual to fall into the void or to that point uh, that's represented on the ground somewhere and essentially fall. His balance is compromised. Everyone has a center of mass, okay? It's a couple inches below the navel, a couple inches in depending upon how large the person may be in the middle. Every human being has a center of mass. We need to understand that. It's an essential principle in our ability to neutralize the threat as quickly as possible. The fact that a person needs to be a triped and is not their bipeds, and they have a center of mass with the immutable law of gravity allows us to unbalance them in many peculiar ways. Okay? Many peculiar ways. So if Eric gets a real strong karate stance, okay, I need to be able to see certain things immediately and eventually learn to do this without having to look for them. He's got a foot here and a foot there. If I push down the line, he's very strong. Okay, I can lean on him all day long. Okay. If, however, looking at where his feet are placed, I draw a line between his ankles and I go out the length of his tibia at a, in a triangle to that, he is not strong at all. Same forward, be strong. Same forward. If I pull him straight forward, he's strong. If I push through his line of strength, he's strong. A little rotation, he's no longer strong. He has to replace that leg. Uh, my opponent is a point in space. I'm a point in space. I can move around him, around him, over or under, and affect his center mass. If I can get control the center mass of a human being, I can uh, neutralize many of his tools. If someone grabs me, okay, both hands real, real firm, I can choose this paradigm, okay, real strong. Get, get your feet set, okay. I can choose a paradigm like that, okay. I can knee him, I can elbow him, I can headbutt him, I can fight with him about it, okay. Now, that takes a little bit of time. And depending upon the other person, their resolve, their physical genetics, how much experience they've had at this, how successful I'm going to be. We've all seen people who could probably just pick us up like that and throw us back on the ground. An elbow in the, uh, elbow in the temple is just going get to them, get them lit up. So we don't, choose, we don't choose to look at it like that. We don't choose to feel that we can always dominate people by force and by leverage, by mental attitude, that an all-out offense is going to be the best way to do things. So we might take a paradigm like this. He grabs me, and he's real firm. And my feelings are, I'm not going to fight about this. I'm not going to be a castle and have to defend a point in space. It could be any point in space. Why don't I change the point in space? So from my elbow to my wrist, because there's two bones here called the ulna and the radius, He's got control. From the wrist down, he doesn't control that. And everything else from the elbow up, he also doesn't control. So why don't, instead of fighting this, why don't I change my physical relationship with him? We call this skeletal relationship. So I'm going to change my physical relationship. I'm going to leave this hand like it's just a point in space. I'm going to come and step through. At this point of coming, stepping through, notice how his body is being gathered. We'll call this gathering because now I have control of his center of mass, his center of gravity. We call this gathering. And in a very unsophisticated way, you could step through and trip. But for us, I'm merely going to bring a hip back. Okay? When you throw someone, depending upon the situation you're in and what you're attempting to accomplish, and to some degree, whether you're armed or not, you'll throw them either close or far away. In an empty-handy situation where I don't want him to be able to get up and, and repeat an attack, more wiser than he was the last time, I want to throw him close so that I can deal with it. I want to finish the show right here. So what, I'm, what I did here is as he came over, I threw him close. I retained his uh, wrist. I placed my knee against the humerus bone just above the elbow. This makes the arm then no longer bendable. It's like a rod. If I place my weight straight down, it fixes it. Okay? It fixes it. As I bend the knee in, it starts to hyperextend the joint. The whole philosophy is don't fight for that position in space. 
The person has a hold of you, let them have that piece. Work everything else. If he's punching or kicking or, or a knife thrust at you, redirect, move your body, but don't fight for that position in space. Okay. Combination of something might be, say he's punching, I redirect, I gather the body here, got the elbow locked, see how his body now is mine, okay, I can throw it. Okay. In a training situation, you throw, you allow the person to roll. In a combative situation, they don't get to roll. It's designed to place them in a position where they are severely injured by the time they get to the ground. Both by the application of the technique, dislocate the elbow, and by the throw, where they land on their head or their shoulder. We're going to allow him to have whatever he grabs, whatever it is that he grabs. Okay? He might be grabbing up my collar and my arm. Okay? And it seems like this is real difficult. Okay, I'm under tension. He's grabbing my collar and my arm. Well, if I allow him to have those pieces that he's grabbing, in fact, at this point, it's real simple for me. Okay, I can drop him backwards because he needs a leg there that he can't place. I could just come up to here, roll my hips through, take him out. This gets to be rather difficult. The direct benefit of uh, study in unarmed combat is uh, learning body control, learning breath control, learning control of your mind, and how to operate under duress. When you get physically excited, uh, you're going to find out that your breathing is going to start to elevate. You're going to get out of control, basically. Now, what happens is that changes it, what's, a lot of that process is your mindset, not knowing what to deal with and how it deals with it, it shoots that adrenaline up there and your body doesn't know how to handle all this adrenaline, it doesn't know how to handle all this new information that's coming into it. And so it, it gets out of balance and it starts breathing and it starts getting erratic. All your training that you've been doing, you've been calm. If you've, if you've done any training, well, live fire training, you've been on a range, you've been shooting, you've been calm. Now all of a sudden, you've got a threat coming at you and now you're breathing and you can't see as well. Your body's bouncing up and down, uh, your shooting platform's flying all over the place. Um, you need to control yourself in these situations. This understanding of breath and proper breath control puts us into the next aspect of Aiki Jiu Jitsu that's essential, to be able to be relaxed under duress. The reasons why, if he grabs me and I choose to make myself rigid and strong and conflicting and he moves my arm around, he's moving me around. He now has control of my center of mass. This is bad. We want control of his. We don't want him to even be able to feel where ours is. So in the relaxed paradigm, if he grabs and he begins to move me like this, he still has no control of my center of gravity whatsoever. And in the process here, has actually placed himself in jeopardy that he may not even be able to feel initially. That's where the throws, that's where the joint locks come from. You're soft not because you're kind-hearted, or you don't want to injure somebody, you're soft because they can't tell where you're coming from. They can't feel it. They will give you, okay, the means to throw them. They will give you the opening, the body part, the throw. They'll give that to you. That's easy to sit here and say, control yourself. The problem is, how do you do that when the guy's standing there with a weapon pointed at you when he's, or he's coming at you with a knife? The guy's six foot six, he's on PCP. How do you say, oh yeah, control yourself? Uh, that's hard to do. That's maybe not always the reality. So how do you get there? The way you get there is you train. You don't theorize, you don't sit down and talk about it. What you do is you go out there and say, what scares me? What really scares me? Okay, a guy coming at me with a knife, that scares me, okay? Let's do it. Let's come at, come at me with a knife let's, and let's learn the techniques that it's going to take to deal with this guy coming at me with a knife. How am I going to do it? Eh, come at me. Often overlooked is the, the idea of maintaining a proper mindset. What you're looking for is uh, trying to achieve 
a, a relative calm. We know there's a storm going on around you. You have a, an aggressive threat in front of you. You may have multiple threats, but you need to, uh, you may see an edged weapon. You need to be calm and you need to train to become calm. The last thing that we really want to set up for ourselves to keep this relatively simple, this is a very complex art that takes a long period of time, is how we use our eyes. We do not focus down. We do not focus our vision. You kind of get the picture? What can you see? A little point I'm going to be striking and nothing else? My whole body's focus for one little one little movement here that may or may not have value to the whole situation. My brain is in a conscious mode. Conscious mind is not real smart. Seven variables plus or minus two. Sit down for a few seconds and think in a room entry how many variables. A little more than nine, I think. Ninety, nine hundred. The only way you can handle that properly is subconscious mind. The way to access the subconscious mind is to relax your eyes. If I'm opposite another person, and that's the, the system I'm going to be dealing with, I'll direct them at the middle of the chest. But I don't look at the middle of the chest. That's where they're directed. And in the process here of looking or directing my eyes and relaxing them, I can see everybody way over here. I'm conscious of all of this. I never look at, at the weapon. The Japanese had a saying, you see the sword that kills you. Mindset, uh, breath control, and vision are integral parts of training in hand-to-hand -hand and ultimately any engagement. One important factor that comes to play when you're doing uh, tactical entries or tactical uh, evolutions, whatever they may be, uh, is the mindset and the bonding uh, that you have to have with those that you operate with. A lot, there's a lot of people in, that are in the business that are in, in it for the hoo They're in it for the Hollywood uh, picture. They like being, you know, I like being a SEAL because look at my poster, look at my picture, look at all my, all my gear, but they really haven't committed themselves up here in the mine. And until you get in some really intense training, you really start finding out who's, who's, who, who's going to be there for you when the crunch really, when it really comes down to it. And mindset really starts, what really helps me is I have to bond with those that are with me. I have to think of them almost as a, as a brother or, or a, um, as my son or my daughter or my wife. I have to connect so close to them that the fear of them getting hurt or injured makes me, uh, puts, puts them before my own life. And what that helps me do, it helps me get away from that target fixed ASIN monster, which when I... When I'm threatened by something, my whole world just goes, oh, it's going to hurt me. There's a guy coming out of that closet. He's going to stab me. There's a guy on the ground. He's rolling around. He's got a gun. He's got a knife. He's going to hurt me. Well, if I'm thinking in that mindset right there, well, I'm thinking defensively. And I can't be thinking that way. If it was my son laying next to some guy who's got a knife getting ready to stab him, I'd be a lot different type of person. I'd be attacking that person. I'd be, my whole world would be, uh, my, <laughs> all my energy and all my mind would just be out to attack that person who's trying to hurt my son. I have to think the same way with somebody who's in my tactical team. You shoot at my partner, I'm coming after you with everything I have. <laughs>
I'm going into a situation that's not good. I'm going right into the power, which, is the, which happens to be that weapon. So I'm going to have to close the distance. So I'm going to go ahead and step under control, and I'm going to make some intimate contact with him right here. What I have going on here is the ability to cam him off now without pushing against him, just rolling this arm. Makes it, it allows me to uh, redirect pressure if he chooses to put pressure on me. It also allows me to uh, get a good idea of what's happening with him, what he's attempting to do. In the dynamic, I continue to slide up. This hand's going to wrap over the top of the muzzle, grabbing this elbow, or not grabbing, but actually making contact with that elbow. Same time, this hand makes contact with this elbow. I'm going to direct pressure over the top of him, and I'm going to start taking his center from him. Th meantime, this elbow is also driving into his, into his other triangulation point, and he ends up falling. If he's presenting a hand or a fist or whatever, rather than trying to knock it away, which as I hit hard and he hits hard, the impact also reaches my center. Well, that's not good. I don't want to be off balance at all. And I always want him to be off balance. So if he's going to come in on that way, I'm going to what we call cam or redirect combination of the two. As he's coming up the leg of the triangle, I am reaching down the leg of the triangle, paralleling his motion. As I do that, if I reach towards his chin, it cams him away. Now, cam versus push. What takes place if I push, I'm applying pressure in a linear fashion here. He can be relatively strong because he can push directly back against it. A cam applies pressure in a continuing arc that's hard, hard to push back against. There's no real peace. You guys all look like you all lift weights. If you're down there doing bench press, it doesn't feel too bad. How about if there's a little guy at the end taking that bar, moving around just a little bit? Okay, it becomes real difficult, right? The muscles, where do I push? How can I do this? There's a lot of weight here. So this, how, this confuses, and he never feels that this is taking place, but you're controlling his center by doing this. I'm never going to be in a position of, when he punches, never gonna be in this position. I'll be in a position of, okay, now see where that places me. Okay, as long as I stay nice and tight to him, I can throw him on the ground from here, okay? I can get a compliant arm lock or something from this position. At this point, of course, you can see a throw to a break, okay, because his elbow is jeopardized here. And as he comes through, okay, now we back that off a little bit because that's real bad on an elbow. But the reality on that would be that there's a broken elbow there and a throw at the same time. All right, first technique I showed you, uh, I closed the gap from the right side, from his right side. Uh, this technique, I'm going to go ahead and close the gap from the left side, utilizing the same principles, a little bit de different application. As he starts turning that weapon toward me, I'm going to make intimate contact with him. As he attempts to pressure, I can just cam that pressure away, set him off balance. In this case, I made intimate contact, I'm going to reposition my skeleton. The left hand just relaxes, makes contact with the weapon. I reach around, and I make contact with the stock. I can make, depending on the weapon, I can make contact with the hand that's on the trigger itself. And I'm going to take his center away from him right now by, and choke him at the same time, by dropping the elbow. I'm not pulling, let me get him set back up here so everybody can see this. I'm not pulling with this hand, because he can fight that pressure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my elbow and drop it to his triangulation point to his rear, and I'm going to take his center from him. He's not in a good situation here. All I need to do is drop and continue to choke. I'm, I'm being fairly nice to him here on the choke. I can choke him out with his weapon from here if I'd like. Go ahead and stand up again, Barry. Okay, one more time, nice and easy. In the dynamic, I touch, I drop, I reposition my skeleton, I drop my elbow. Now if I want to, I can keep him standing up straight right here. I'm in control, and I can choke him out with his weapon. Watch this one more time. This hand right here, okay, bring the gun around right here. You can just, you, James had it turned in there. Okay, sometimes I'll, I'll bring it underneath too, depending on what's happening. 
but yeah, relax. you can come all the way in. Yeah, There's okay. What's option. happening? Go ahead, do it again. Just relax. I'm still seeing a lot of that. Okay. Uh -huh. Just come in, relax. Cause you want it. You want it. Pull from the elbow. Now you want to try and keep your balance as much as you can. Okay. Let's go through another common situation. I get into a close quarter situation and I've allowed someone to get too close to me. I've made that mistake, but I don't want to make any further mistakes. And I allow someone to grab the end of my muzzle. He's trying to control the end of this muzzle. Now what happens typically is when you feel that pressure out on the end of the muzzle, you, you immediately want to fight that point. You want to try and get it back. Violates our basic principle. What we want to do is realign from behind. In other words, I'm going to keep that point fixed in space and I'm going to realign the back of my back of my weapon to where I want to go. And we can play this game all day long and he's going to lose it every time. I realign from behind and he spends a lot of time pointing the weapon at what appears to be pointing the weapon at himself. And it doesn't take a lot. It's not a strength issue. It's a simple physics issue. Okay. Again, he reaches up, grabs. I quickly want to realign from behind and I keep that muzzle right where I want it to, center of mass. Some of the general mistakes that people make in prisoner handling is just getting too close to the guy with your weapon. I love to take a weapon away from somebody who puts it too close to my face. It's like, here, have this. They may think they, they got me uh, in the uh, best position here when they put that gun at my face, but in my position, I just, cool, thank you very much. I'm going to take that weapon from you. And next thing you know, uh, their whole world has just kind of changed a little bit. And you may have two or three people that are in that room with you, and now that you have his weapon, I'm going to use him some more. I'm going to use him as a human shield. So once he gets that weapon too close to me, it's mine. Uh, a lot of times they don't even have the weapon too close to me. All they have to do is be across the room from me, and just by my body language, I can just I can come to him, and and he I can see I, a lot of times you can just see it in their eyes that they are not in a lethal force situation, or their their mindset isn't correct, and so you literally walk over to them and take the weapon away from them. So a lot of it is they get too close with the weapon, or they use the wrong technique, or their mindset's wrong. All right, I'd like to uh, illustrate another solution to the same problem of someone grabbing the end of your muzzle. Again, I was compromised. Someone grabbed the end of my muzzle. Moving, grabs, my, grabs the end of my muzzle. At this point, I'm going to make intimate contact with his ind index finger. He could grab up here on the, on the uh, guard. He can grab up on the muzzle. It really doesn't matter. I'm going to make him a piece of me now. He's decided he wants to hook up with me. That's fine. I'll go ahead and I'll realign from behind. He cannot control these pressures out here. I leave that point in space. I'm moving the weapon up and around. And now I start dropping him down with my center. I'm in control. If I need to shoot, I shoot. If not, I, I have him in a very compliant situation. Go ahead and tap if you have a problem. Okay. And he wants to tap out. All right, another situation. Again, muzzles are trying to be controlled by the opponent. He goes ahead and reaches up and he pushes it out and away. Rather than fighting for that point, I'm going to go ahead and lower my center a little bit. I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and drive that muzzle up and around behind him, pressure from behind. Once I feel he's unweighted, I'm going to go ahead and bring my left hip back, and he goes. Let's try it again. And, and uh, Eric, don't fall unless you have to fall. All right. Again, nice and slow. He pushes out. I drive him up and around, turn the hips, and I control him. Okay, this situation, I'm moving through a compartment, a room, and I have an opponent that comes to the left side, grabs strong. I'm going to move as if he's not there. I'm going to let him have this weapon. I'm going to step through, take his center. He's off balance. Take him into his triangulation point, and I'm back on my shooting platform. Down, stay down, down. What we want to talk about is an area that you hope you don't get into uh, in any uh, close quarter situation, but you can't necessarily stop it from happening in all situations, and that's a situation where Someone is uh, going to try and take you to the ground, or you find yourself on the ground. He's in a superior position here. Uh, typically, uh, the opponent's going to want to punch, elbow, uh, headbutt from this position here. And I want to try and uh, reverse the situation as quickly as possible. Common mistake is reaching to try and stop these type attacks, just covering up, basically ineffective. We don't want to fight from that point of view. What we want to do is we want to understand the relationship from, from hip to hip, my center to his center, and I want to control that fight or that uh, relationship. 
So as Eric tries to punch, for example, I can put my hands behind my, behind my head as an illustration, and as he attempts to punch, I move my hips, and I control the situation from there. Uh, a lot of people, again, they get involved up here when they need to be involved down here. I took him to a point out here, the triangulation point out here. I didn't try to, try to throw him sideways where he could post up with an arm, and I really haven't gained much. Biggest window of opportunity, biggest hole exists right out in front of me. I can help myself out by trapping a leg, by just flopping a leg here, and trapping something else or getting him involved in something else where he feels like he has to get overextended, he gets involved, and I reverse the situation. Eric's in the best situation at this time. His stomach is to my back. My prime directive is to forestall the choke and get to a better relationship. The next best relationship is my stomach to his stomach, him on top, He's, he has his legs over the top of me. What I've done, I've gone from worse to a little bit better situation. The next best position for me will be to take him up and over, reverse that. He still has his legs wrapped around me, he's still in the better position, the superior position, and I want to go ahead and get where my legs are wrapped over the top of him or mount him. There's a lot of ways to do that. In this case, since he's got his feet pinned, I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and keep him. Uh, I'm going to reach through, reach out and around, put my weight on him, keep my weight on him, start putting him under duress, and remounting. Now at this point, I've, I've again, I'm in a superior position. If I can, I, I can take him from here with a lot of different tools. Or if he makes some kind of mistake of trying to get to his hands and knees, which a lot of people like to do, I've now established the most dominant position, which happens to be stomach to his back, and I have a lot of tools at this point. Okay. I eliminate a lot. He's got a lot of problems at this point. Okay, I want to deal with a little bit on counter takedowns. We've got an opponent that wants to come in. Uh, typically, people overextend. They lead with their head when they're trying to do these takedowns. They don't execute them properly. You can look for that. It's going to come in a, in a variety of situations. Eric's going to come nice and slow at first. Uh, I'm on balance at this time. I don't have any other weapons available. He comes in. What I want to do is I want to tip him, and I want to sink the elbow. I'm sinking my elbow here, and I'm preventing him from getting my sidearm. Okay, let's try that again. Comes in. I tip. Prevent him from getting that sidearm and I re-grab the clothing or my gear, whatever it happens to be, sink the elbow, and then I present my center, and he's tapping. I'm kinking the pipe down there. Front choke, very effective against uh, a, a improper takedown. If he comes with a lot more momentum, what I'm going to do, and we'll, we'll take it slower than we would in, in the actual dynamics so I can explain it, if he comes in with a little more momentum, I forstay it, I go ahead and let him take it. I wrap, I sink, I prevent this hand from grabbing any other weapons. All I do is present my center. What I mean by that, I'm extending from my center, and he's choked. If uh, this technique is uh, done correctly, probably won't even have to choke him. Give me some serious damage to the neck on the way down. Another typical attack. Uh, I, I let an opponent... I get to my rear, I'm unaware of him, and he attempts to tackle low. Just go ahead and go to that point. What I want to do here is I want to, uh, rather than let him take me forward, I'm going to go ahead and present the hips and put all my weight on top of him at this point. I let him carry me. I can feel the tension. He's having a difficult time carrying me. And I smear my body on him, and I get to a better position here. Okay? And I can access my other weapons if I need to. I can get some assistance, but I've reversed that situation. Okay, let's do that in real time, Eric, real quick. Tackles low. Zip, smear, reverse. Another situation, back turn to the opponent. He's attacking from the rear. He attempts to tackle me. Nice high grab around the arms, and momentum's going forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that momentum that, that he's already given me, and I'm going to step out and continue... With that momentum, taking them out, taking them out, and then I'm going to step out and vacate the space. Palm up, 
Roll the joint down. You see that body flip up and you know you got them locked out. If I need to, I can access the weapons I need to access. As we do an entry, sometimes you'll start with people and their first reaction is just to go, I, I don't want no part of this. Okay, now they may be just startled in the fact that, hey, I, I don't want no part of this. And they're just trying to get away and they really don't know what to do. They're, they're scared, they don't know what's going on. What we want to do is be able to take advantage of somebody who's got their hands in this position here. We want to be able, as soon as we touch them, get control of this person right away. The reason is, is he may not, be, he's not necessarily the only threat in the room. Maybe he's the only one we see and maybe we have multiple rooms that we have to clear. But we have to take care of this threat like right now. We don't have time to play around with it. All right, Yasu, go ahead. Now, a technique that we do is as we come into the space here, I have my cover man here. As we, as we enter the space, in this particular situation, I have his hands up. Now, one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to come over here and, and lead with my gun. As you can see, this presents him with a weapon. That's the last thing I want to do is go ahead and give him my gun. So what I want to do is as I come into here, I'm going to slide up. I'm going to have my foot and my body blocking the weapon from his control. I'm reaching up with my hand. I'm reaching up, getting control of this hand right here. Now, you notice that I want to grab him and get control. And remember the old castle effect. I want to get into this castle fight here. What I want to do is I want to touch up here and roll into the hand to here. At this point here, I'm going to just drop my elbow. And I'm going to take him down to his triangulation point. Now, as I do, I'm taking him and bringing him down to his triangulation point, and I'm going to flame. I'm bringing him down, and I'm flaying him. Down to the ground! Two steps forward. Okay, got him. Little move, little shot. Okay, at this point here, if you'll notice, I have a problem. I have a weapon in my hand, and I have a prisoner. Not, not a good situation here. So what I don't want to do is lose control. If you'll notice, I've got his arm spread out here, and I've got his hand and his fingers bent in this fashion here. I've got him flayed out. Now what I want to do is get this elbow here into that hip and holster my weapon. At this point here, I'm going to bring him up, bring the arm around, and I, what I want to do here is I want to get my hand into here, into that part of his arm, and I'm going to roll my hand into it and get my knee in to his shoulder. This locks his shoulder into position, and I bend the elbow. If I, the arm is straight, I have a tendency to lose it. So what I want to do is I want to have that arm bent so I have more leverage here on it. Now, what's happening with this arm is this arm is doing a camming situation here. I'm camming the arm and I'm rolling at the same time. I'm literally just taking my fingers and I'm pointing them to the ground. The only problem is his arm's in be mixed in there. So what happens, we have a blending here with my arm and his arm, and I roll the arm, bend it, and now I have control. He's all locked up here. My shoulder's locked. My, my knee locks his shoulder. If I don't have that shoulder, it allows that shoulder to move around. So with this knee locked into here, I'm locking up that shoulder. The hand is pressing down on the shoulder joint, and I'm using my rolling camming technique, pointing my arm to lock out his arm, putting him in pain compliance. My other uh, knee is locked into his hip, pulling into his hip. At this point, I get into my cuffing technique here, a way you can do it. One typical way is to come in here, put the cuff on. Once I have the cuff on, I now have this lever here. I no longer need this lever in here. I have the lever now up here. So now I can come over here. I now control him here. I still have the elbow locked down. I still have this arm bar here. I still have him locked up. Now with a little pain, I can ask him to bring me my other arm, bring you your other arm. Once I get it here, the other cuff comes on, get him cuffed. And now I have him cuffed. The key here is the keyholes are up. If you look, his thumbs are in this configuration here. The swivels or the back part of the cuff is in the back part of his hand. And the cuff keys are up. What you don't want to do is have those cuff keys in a place where his little fingers can get to them. That's how they end, uh, can get out of cuffing. It also makes it harder for him to get out of the cuff once he's cuffed like this, for him to turn over on his back and now try to get, try to get his hands out in front of him a lot harder with his hands back in this configuration. If the hand is twisted, one of the hands is twisted or both hands, are, the cuffs would be twisted in this fashion, it's much easier for my body to slide my butt through that and get out of it. So that's why you want to have those cuffs to the back part of the hand. Now, in this particular situation here, this will be my bad guy here, or my threat as I come in. The problem I have here is if I deal with him in this configuration here, he's got all these tools he can deal with me. So what I want to do is I want to get away from those tools. So what we do is we just 
go right on by him. At this point here, I'm trying to get in behind him. He's focused on, uh, on my partner. My partner can be talking to him. The key here is once I touch this guy, I want to I control him. Right back to our old, old school. As soon as we touch him, we have to control him. Now, as what the technique here would do is we grab the lapel and we're going to drive the elbow down. And we're going to drive him right down into his triangulation point. And once I get him moving, I want to bring him out and stretch him out so I can cuff him later. So the technique here simply is here, drop the elbow, and he gets out. Now what happens here, now I'm starting my prisoner handling techniques. I have a cover man. I don't want to be cuffing him with a weapon in my hand. So all I want to do is put that weapon away, come in, again. As soon as I touch him, I want to gain control. So his hand is in this configuration here. I bring him up. I got a twist here. I'm locking his arm up here. And I'm going to take him and I'm going to bring him over. Now if you notice, I got the arm here. I got the, the arm locked out here. I go right into my cuffing procedure, just like we did before. And we go right into our cuffing procedure at this point. My cover man, you notice how he is changing positions in relationship to what I'm doing with the, the prisoner or the suspect. If he needs to move around, then he needs to move around. He's constantly assessing his position in relationship to the command doing the cuffing. In my experience uh, with training uh, using, uh, like say, uh, prisoner handling techniques, what I found out, the best way to do is you go out there and be the prisoner. You be the bad guy. And what will happen is you will start seeing a lot of mistakes being made by those who are trying to handle you. And that's, that opens up a whole new world because if you're just doing the uh, part where I'm doing the prisoner handling. I'm getting you ha in handcuffs. I'm putting you under duress. I got the gun pointed at you. You're only seeing it from one direction. What you want to do is also be the bad guy. So then all of a sudden you start seeing, you start seeing the mistakes. And once you start seeing the openings, you start realizing, hey, if they don't do it right, or if there's a breakdown here or a breakdown there, I can make this, take this and turn it into my advantage. So it, can, it does have some merit. <laughs> it, is a, it is a subject you better take serious because it can turn around on you very quickly. Since the commissioning of the United States Navy SEALs by President Kennedy for the purpose of operations in the Vietnam conflict, Navy SEALs have enjoyed the reputation of being among the best trained combatants in the world. This reputation has been deservedly gained through the highly effective and innovative employment of weapons and tactics brought from intensive training. In this modern, high-tech world of electronic weapons, computers, and an almost obsessive attention to equipment selection, one must be mindful of potentially falling into the trap of believing all is secure. The foundational operating system, the man himself, must be carefully examined and evaluated. The mind, body, and spirit are inseparable components that must be trained to act in unison when faced with life-threatening situations. In order to maintain peak operational readiness, the Navy SEALs are continually pursuing the most effective strategies, techniques, and training methods available.
Combative Concepts Incorporated is leading the way in dynamic, realistic, and practical weapons and tactics training. Founded by former Naval Special Warfare members David Maynard and Ken Good, Combative Concepts Incorporated offers training in a wide variety of areas, including close quarters battle, high power rifle and sniper operations, unarmed and knife combat. Combative Concepts offers varying levels of firearms and tactical training for military, law enforcement, and security groups, as well as authorized civilian individuals. Uh, the mindset for this course and this type of training is that you want to provide a platform or a medium for force-on-force -force training. Now the problem is you, you come into my house, threaten my daughter, or my son, or my wife, I'm not going to be in a real friendly mind. I'm going to hunt you down and blow you away, period. If you are interested in training with Combative Concepts, contact the Enrollment Coordinator at 1-800-836-9848.